Everyone in Fair Camp knew the story of old Mother Patin. She had undoubtedly been unhappy with her man, had old Mother Patin, for her man had beaten her during his lifetime as a man threshes wheat in his barns. He was owner of a fishing smack and had married her long ago because she was nice, even though she was poor. Patin, a good seaman, but a brute, frequented old Aubin's tavern where on ordinary days he drank four or five brandies and on days when he had made a good catch, eight or ten, and even more. The brandy was served to customers by old Aubin's daughter, a pleasant-faced, dark-haired girl who drew custom to the house merely by her good looks, for no one had ever wagged a tongue against her. When Patin entered the tavern, he was content to look at her and talk civilly to her, quiet, decent conversation. When he had drunk the first brandy, already he found her nicer. At the second he was winking at her. At the third he was saying, Miss Desiree, if only you would, without ever finishing the sentence. At the fourth he was trying to hold her by the petticoat to embrace her, and when he had reached the tenth, it was old Aubin who served him the rest. The old wine-seller, who knew every trick of the trade, used to send Desire round between the tables to liven up the orders for drinks, and Desire, who was not old Aubin's daughter for nothing, paraded her petticoat among the drinkers and banded jests with a smile on her lips and a twinkle in her eye. By dint of drinking brandies, Patin grew so familiar with the serious face that he thought of it even at sea when he threw his nets into the water, out on the open sea, on windy nights and calm nights, on moonlit nights and black nights, he thought of it as he held the helm in the stern of his boat, while his four companions slept with their heads on their arms. He always saw her smiling at him, pouring out the yellow brandy with a lift of her shoulders, then coming towards him, saying, There, is this what you want? And, by dint of treasuring her so in eye and mind, he reached such a pitch of longing to marry her that, unable to restrain himself longer, he asked her in marriage. He was rich, owner of his boat, his nets, and a house at the foot of the cliff on the retinue. While old Auban had nothing, he was, therefore, accepted eagerly, and the wedding took place as quickly as possible, both parties being, for different reasons, anxious to make it an accomplished fact. But three days after the marriage was over, Patam was no longer able to imagine in the least how he had come to think Desiree different from other women. He must have been a rare fool, to hamper himself with a penniless girl who had wheedled him with her tongue. He went cursing along the shore, breaking his pipe between his teeth, swearing at his tackle, and having cursed heartily with every term he could think of everything he knew, he spat out the anger still left in his stomach on the fish and crabs that he drew one by one out of his nets, throwing them into the baskets to an accompaniment of oaths and foul words. Then, returning to his house, where he had his wife, old Aubin's daughter, within reach of his tongue and his hand, he soon began to treat her 
as the lowest of the low. Then, as she listened resignedly, being used to the paternal violence, he became exasperated by her calm, and one evening he beat her. After this, his home became a place of terror. For ten years nothing was talked of on the retinue but the beatings Patan inflicted on his wife, and his habit of cursing when he spoke to her, whatever the occasion. He cursed, in fact, in a unique way, with a wealth of vocabulary and a forceful vigour of delivery possessed by no sober man in Faircomp. As soon as his boat reached the harbour mouth back from fishing, they waited expectantly for the first broadside he would discharge on the pier from his deck the moment he saw the white bonnet of his other half. Standing in the stern, he tacked, his glance fixed ahead and on the sheets where the sea was running high, and in spite of the close attention required by the narrow, difficult passage, in spite of the great waves running mountain high in the narrow gully, he endeavoured to pick out, from the midst of the women waiting in the spray of the breakers for the sailors, his woman, old Aubin's daughter, the pauper wench. Then, as soon as he saw her, in spite of the clamour of waves and wind, he poured on her a volley of abuse with such vocal energy that everyone laughed at it although they pitied her deeply. Then, when his boat reached the quay, he had a way of discharging his ballast of civility, as he said, while he unloaded his fish, which attracted round him all the rascals and idlers of the harbour. It issued from his mouth now like cannon shots, terrible and short, now like thunderclaps that rolled for five minutes such a tempest of oaths that he seemed to have in his lungs all the storms of the Eternal Father. Then, when he had left his boat and net among the curious spectators and fishwives, he fished up again from the bottom of the hold a fresh cargo of insults and hard words, and escorted her in such fashion to their home, she in front, he behind, she weeping, he shouting. Then, alone with her, doors shut, he beat her on the least pretext. Anything was enough to make him lift his hand, and once he had begun, he never stopped, spitting in her face all the time the real causes of his hate. At each blow, at each thump, he yelled, Oh, you penniless slut, or oh, you gutter snipe, or oh, you miserable starveling. I did a fine thing the day I washed my mouth out with the firewater of your scoundrel of a father. She passed her days now, poor woman, in a state of incessant terror. And this lasted for ten years. She was so broken that she turned pale when she talked to anyone, no matter who, and no longer thought of anything but the beatings that threatened her and she had grown as skinny, yellow, and dried up as a smoked fish. One night, when her man was at sea, she was awakened by the noise, like the growling of a beast, which the wind makes when it gets up, like an unleashed hound. She sat up in bed, uneasy, then, hearing nothing more, lay down again. But almost at once there was a moaning in the chimney that shook the whole house and ran across the whole sky as if a pack of furious animals had crossed the empty spaces, panting and bellowing. Then she got up and ran to the harbour. Other women were running from all sides with lanterns. Men ran up and Every one watched the foam flashing white in the darkness on the crest of the waves out at sea. 
The storm lasted fifteen hours. Eleven sailors returned no more, and Patin was among them. The wreckage of his boat, the Jeune Amélie, was recovered off the Epp, near Saint-Valéry. They picked up the bodies of his sailors, but his body was never found, as the hull of the small craft had been cut in two. His wife for a long time expected and dreaded his return, for if there had been a collision, it might have happened that the colliding vessel had taken him on board and carried him on to a distant country. Then, slowly, she grew used to the thought that she was a widow, even though she trembled every time a neighbour or a beggar or a tramping peddler entered her house abruptly. One afternoon, almost four years after the disappearance of her man, she stopped on her way along the Rue Orgeves before the house of an old captain who had died recently and whose belongings were being sold. Just at that moment, they were auctioning a parrot, a green parrot with a blue head, which was regarding the crowd with a disgruntled and uneasy air. Three francs, said the auctioneer, a bird that talks like a lawyer. Three francs. A friend of widow Patin jogged her elbow. You ought to buy that. You're rich, she said. It would be company for you. He is worth more than thirty francs, that bird. You can always sell him again for twenty to twenty-five easy. Four francs, ladies, four francs, the man repeated. He sings vespers and preaches like the priest. He is a phenomenon, a miracle. But a patin raised the bid by fifty centimes, and they handed her the hook-nosed creature in a little cage, and she carried him off. Then she installed him in her house, and was opening the iron wire door to give the creature a drink. She got a bite on the finger that broke the skin and drew blood. Oh, the wicked bird, said she. However, she presented him with hemp seed and maize, then left him smoothing his feathers while he peered with a malicious air at his new home and his new mistress. Next morning, day was beginning to break when Widow Patan heard with great distinctiveness a loud, resonant, rolling voice. Patan's voice, shouting, Get up, slut! Her terror was such that she hid her head under the bedclothes, for every morning in the old days, as soon as he opened his eyes, her dead husband shouted in her ears those three familiar words. Trembling, huddled into a ball, her back turned to the thrashing that she was momentarily expecting. She murmured, her face hidden in the bed, God Almighty, he is here! God Almighty, he is here! He has come back! God Almighty! Minutes passed, and no other sound broke the silence of her room. Then, shuddering, she lifted her head from the bed, sure that he was there, spying on her, ready to strike. She saw nothing but a ray of sun falling across the window pane, and she thought, he is hiding for sure. She waited a long time, then thought, I must have been dreaming, seeing he doesn't show himself. She was shutting her eyes again a little, reassured, when right in her ears the furious voice burst out, the thunderous voice of her drowned man shouting, Get up, damn and blast it, get up, you bitch! She leapt out of bed, jerked out by her instinctive obedience and the passive obedience of a woman broken in by blows, who still remembers after four years and always will remember and always will obey that voice. And she said, Here I am, Patin, what do you want? 
but Patan did not answer. Then, bewildered, she looked round her and searched everywhere, in the cupboards, in the chimney, under the bed, still finding no one, and at last let herself fall into a chair, distracted with misery, convinced that the spirit of Patan itself was there, near her, come back to torture her. Suddenly, she remembered the loft, which could be reached from outside by a ladder. He had certainly hidden himself in there to take her by surprise. He must have been kept by savages on some shore, unable to escape sooner, and he had come back more wicked than ever. She could not doubt it. The mere tone of his voice convinced her. She asked her head, turned toward the ceiling, are you up there, Patin? Patin did not answer. Then she went out, and, in an unutterable terror that set her heart beating madly, she climbed the ladder, opened the garret window, looked in, and saw nothing. She entered, searched, and found nothing. Seated on a truss of hay, she began to cry, but while she was sobbing, shaken by an acute and supernatural terror, she heard in the room below Patin telling his story. He seemed less angry, calmer, and he was saying, Filthy weather, high wind, filthy weather. I've had no breakfast, damn it. She called him through the ceiling. I'm here, Pata. I'll make you some soup. Don't be angry. I'm coming. Then she climbed down at a run. There was no one in the house. She felt her body giving way, as if death had his hand on her. And she was going to run out to ask for help from the neighbors, when just in her ear the voice cried, I've had no breakfast, damn it. The parrot, in its cage, was watching her with his round, malicious, wicked eye. She stared back at him in amazement, murmuring, Oh, it's you, he answered, shaking his head. Wait, 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 I'll teach you to idle. What were her thoughts? She felt, she realized, that this was none other than the dead man who had returned and hidden himself in the feathers of this creature to begin torturing her again. That he was going to swear as of old all day and find fault with her and shout insults to attract the neighbor's attention and make them laugh. Then she flung herself across the room opened the cage, seized the bird who defended himself and tore her skin with his beak and his claws, but she held him with all her might in both hands and, throwing him on the ground, rolled on top of him with mad frenzy, crushed him and made him a mere rag of flesh, a little soft green thing that no longer moved or spoke and hung limp. Then, wrapping him in a dishcloth as a shroud, she went out in her shift, barefooted, crossed the quay against which the sea was breaking in small waves, and, shaking the cloth, let fall this small green thing that looked like a handful of grass. Then she returned, threw herself on her knees before the empty cage, and utterly overcome by what she had done, she asked pardon of the good God, sobbing as if she had just committed a horrible crime.